Coaches, welcome back to the Cutting Edge Coaching Podcast, where we connect you with coaches, experts, and leaders from across sports to help you grow as a coach and develop better teams and better people. I'm excited to be replaying episode five of the podcast with John Kessel, a longtime coach educator for USA Volleyball. This is a replay, so the links or the, that I might mention in the episode uh, might be out of date. So if you want the most up-to-date links with our free resources and more information, including the podcast notes, or if you're interested in learning about coach mentorship, just check the links in the show details for all the updated links or to reach out to us. Enjoy the episode. Most coaches practice for practice and not for performance. They practice so practice looks good and, and you hear a lot of them in sports going i don't get it we look so good in practice and we it's like when we go out there we don't know what we're doing yeah that's because you're not practicing in reality you're not practicing the way it's actually going to happen Welcome to the Coaches Club Podcast, powered by Transform Sport, where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches and leaders in sport that will help you grow as an effective teacher and transformational leader so that you and your team can reach your potential. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome John Kessel to the Coaches Club Podcast today. Starting in 1985, John worked for the national governing body of the sport, USA Volleyball, primarily as Director of Sport Development, retiring in 2020. He has been coaching since 1971 at the collegiate level or above, including women's U.S. Open titles in 1986 and 1987. A sought-after international lecturer, he has conducted seminars in all 50 states and in over 70 nations. He has been part of every Summer Olympics or Paralympics, but two, starting in 1984, and many beach and para-volley volleyball world championships. He also retired in 2020 after a decade as director of development and board member for World Para-Volley. He founded with his wife Lily and currently operates their family legacy project, Bison Peak Lodge at Puma Hills. Located at 3,000 meters, just 100 kilometers from Colorado Springs, and a unique headwall valley, its mission is to serve as a place of healing for veterans and first responders with over 25 teepees and many other unique structures to host healing. You can find a link to that website in the show notes. He is currently secretary of the Norseca Development Commission, part of the national staff of Beach Nation, and serves on the board of Starlings USA, the nation's leading volleyball program for economically disadvantaged kids. In 1995, Volleyball's magazine's special centennial issue named him one of the 50 most important people in the world within the sport in the last 100 years. In 2013, the American Volleyball Coaches Association inducted him as their 60th ever member of the AVCA Coaches Hall of Fame. In 2019, he became the 50th recipient in history of USAV's highest award for a lifetime of service, the Freer Award. Also in 2019, Colorado College, his alma mater, awarded him the school's highest honor, the Luis Benze Award in recognition of his influence in shaping the lives of players and coaches around the world and his achievements in advancing and elevating the science of teaching and coaching. His work in breaking down the silos of learning between sports has seen him keynote speaking for USA Hockey, USA Shooting, USA Sailing, USA Synchronized Swimming, USA Swimming, USA Pole Vaulting, the American Hockey Coaches Association, U.S. Olympic Committee and U.S. Paralympics, FIVB, IOC, and IPC, and several Major League Baseball teams. I'm honored to have John on the podcast today, and I'm confident that this conversation will help you get better at teaching and leading. Enjoy the episode. Why did you get into coaching? And then, as well, like, why did you decide to coach coaches? And you kind of started to talk about that with the impact, yeah. but... Well, it really is the impact now. I'd have to say also that um, volleyball is a pretty unique sport. Uh, Remarkably, I think, people don't realize this, but when I've calculated that an Olympic team from the start of their Olympic tournament, not practice, but their tournament, until they win a gold medal like we did in 2008, Our men's team, on average, each player touched the ball on their skin for uh, 
less than a minute. Okay, that, that's like two weeks. And other sports, you know, you that are American, you know, you don't fumble the ball. Most football players don't really have any ball skills. They just push people around. And, you know, baseball people just sort of sit out there. And when they do something, they catch it and they have a mitt and then they throw it. Um, or golf clubs, which rebound the ball like we do in volleyball. But my God, they spend billions of dollars on designing new golf club heads. And my mom's tennis racket, I swear to God, it used to be about this big. And now it's got to be this big as they design a better rebound surface. But in volleyball, you, you know, nudists play it. You, 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 <laughs> you play with what you are. And that's what makes the Paralympic side. You know, I'm, I'm missing two legs. Oh, okay, well, you can still play the Paralympics sitting volleyball on the floor or over a tennis height net. And so all these disciplines, whether you're playing doubles or sixes or Chinese nine man, you know, it's just a, I'm obviously passionate about volleyball and, you know, we've got 11 and unders playing in a national championship and we have 75 and overs or 79 and overs playing in their age division, 79 and over. I mean, it's truly a lifetime sport. That's why I think I chose volleyball. Plus, it's really cool to jump up and hit the crap out of something, but never have to hit a person. You know, you're, it's a not contact, but there's a lot of contact. So it was the summer camps where I made that shift as to, as to why I started to coach coaches because of that um, impact we just talked about. Um, but I, I coached tens of thousands of kids, too. I mean, I probably did 500 summer camps, and and that's a... 150 kids per pop. So I don't know how many thousand kids there that is, but there's a lot. <laughs> and the beauty of camp, the beauty of your, your TED talk is that in that condensed hour, you're going to impact somebody way more than a season. Uh, in the camps we did, we did three a days. <laughs> we, we did three a days. We did uh, morning, afternoon, and evening training, five days total in a row. Then we took a 24 hour break. <laughs> yeah, 24 hour break. That meant you train morning until an afternoon until two. Then you got 24 hours off. And then at two until six and seven until nine, you did two more sessions but that was 24 hours off. Oh yeah, that's a lot of free time. You know, you had time to wash your clothes and maybe go catch a movie in an air conditioned place or something. And then boom, you're, so we were just going back to back to back to back to back. And, and, and we were guinea pig and we we're every evening. How can we do this better? How can we do this better? And so it, we just had a, a large amount of, uh, you know, almost experiments going on in, in the gym, which we like to call an exploratorium. Bill Neville, our Olympic coach, you know, I love that a gym is an exploratorium. Now what's gonna be fun, and what I hope happens to you too, in your, ex, in your TED talk is the principles of learning, the principles of becoming better and risking, the principles are almost the same in business as they are in in sport and as they are in things like surgery uh, you know a surgeon is a, using motor skill uh, sports are motor skills well a surgeon does motor skills and you and how they learn more effectively and you know they always train in reality they go from a pig to a human but they're training in reality and one of the biggest problems i see in sport that you may have picked up in threads of your other research is that most coaches practice for practice and not for performance they practice so practice looks good and, and you hear a lot of them in sports going i don't get it we look so good in practice and we it's like when we go out there we don't know what we're doing yeah that's because you're not practicing in reality you're not practicing the way it's actually going to happen and in 
I, I did a clinic for a football program this morning, soccer program uh, overseas. You know, they they agree that maybe in our sport in tennis and other sports, the most important skill is reading. You know, when you're deep with is anticipating is knowing what the other side is doing as the ball comes over the net. But in my sport, our, I spent my first probably five years training in front of the net, throwing balls and throwing balls up to get hit. And, and it's like, OK, practice looks good. But it, when they play, the ball gets served over the net. And after two touches, you got to jump up and hit the ball over the net. And you haven't practiced that at all, you know, except for when they play. So practice looks good versus performance. And it was a late Richard Schmidt, um, the motor learning professor out of UCLA that wrote five you know, editions of his great book, Motor Learning Performance, Principles to Practice, who, who was the best at helping everybody, I think, see how, yeah, that's because you look good in practice, but it's not transferring to the game. And, you, you know, you're not going to have time to use it in your talk because it's such a fast thing. But I know that I was greatly impacted by the backwards bicycle video. And if you haven't watched it, after we talk, take seven, eight minutes, watch it, and then go, what does this mean to learning? What does this mean to specificity? It's, it's my argument that things are very specifically learned, that the research, the science shows that transfer doesn't occur. I, I'm really good at doing this, rolling this ball, and therefore I should be good at doing this. No, the best example, running through the, the speed ladders. <laughs> okay, I get really good and fast at running through a speed ladder. What the hell does that mean? It means I can run through a speed ladder fast. It has zero transfer or to do with you running quickly as a football person who can cut. If there's anything that does that, it's playing tag more. The more you play tag, the probably better you are as a running back getting away from somebody. You know? But running a speed ladder is just a waste of time. And Schmidt even said that Drills and lead up activities take considerable practice time and do not produce much transfer. So practice the game instead. But coaches want practice to look good. So they do this other bullshit and then they don't do good in the game. <laughs> Pretty simple. Yeah. Um, honest, but, but very true. Uh, I've, I've spent a lot of time reflecting on that myself and just asking the question, okay, does this actually happen? What is the purpose of doing, doing this? Um, and so I guess that my follow-up question to that would be, is there a place for blocked practice on, on specific skills? And if so, what does that look like to do it in a way that will still transfer? Well, I think there's two answers to that. The first answer that I use a lot, I don't see it in the research. I just know that it works in, at least in my sport. And when I talked to the football guy, he, he thought it would work in soccer. And that is the first 10 trials is all. I mean, that's, that's coming out of Schmidt. He's saying uh, six to 10 trials, then get to random. I prefer to always check for understanding. And when I check for understanding, even when they're advancing, I do it without a ball. Now, in darts or in you know, bowling or whatever, it, you know, things are pretty blocked. Archery is very blocked. You're, you know, here's the gold target and you're supposed to hit it and win the Olympic gold medal. But even they have come to realize that it's better to randomize. I think it's because it creates a a wider uh, curve of experience that lets you narrow in on the thing, knowing, and this is really important, I, didn't, I should have talked to this other guy about this, but that variance is part of humanness. We're not metal robotic machines. We are humans <laughs> and we have an incredible amount of variance. So, you know, I think the one of the best examples is taking a, 
a hammer and putting out a nail and you go bam, 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 bam on the hammer for a hundred times. And then you look at the thing. Well, look, I hit the hammer, the nail a hundred times. Yeah, you did. But if you look at the pattern of how you hit on the hammer in all a hundred successes, it forms a perfect bell curve. So yeah, most of your hits were near the middle, but you vary this way and you vary that way on the head of the of the um, hammer. I I love to use a clip of Ernie Els, two-time Masters, number one in the world, great golfer. I use a clip showing him six putting from two and a half feet. How the hell does a Masters champion six putt from two and a half feet? He's a human. <laughs> he, he, he probably five putted twice in his life and he probably four putted a hundred times in his life and he three putted a thousand times in his life and he two putted the most and he sank the putts on one putt a whole bunch too because he's a pro and he's really good but there's this variance so when when we do things like my sport where things are really bam 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 happening so fast i i want my athletes to understand variance so i don't say hit the line because if you say hit the line half of the balls go out and the other half go in off of aiming at the line if i say aim at the net half of the balls go into the net and the other half will clear the net so you want to remember and when you're talking with 13 year olds the variance is huge and as they get better it gets smaller but I love the work that we did in 2016 with the FIVB. They captured, for example, all the serve receives of every Olympic team. And it's a bell curve. <laughs> it's amazing. Yes, the setters right there were aiming at that, but the actual reception is a bell curve. And because of that, specific to my sport of volleyball, when you stand at the net, which is tradition with the target, then half the balls fall short of that target, but the other half go over the net, <laughs> which is really bad. And so with young kids whose variance is so huge, you move the target way off the net so their variance keeps the ball on your side of the net. So just that's a big word or big principle of humanness that not enough people realize as learning takes place even with great players there still will be variants because they're humans they're not machines yeah that's that's really good and, and powerful and i'm thinking about you know basketball specifically mm -hmm. i coach and i think one of the biggest objections that most coaches have is when you talk about random practice like that or creating as many scenarios that happen in the game as possible is that they feel like it's just rolling the ball out there and letting kids play. Um, yeah. how, how do you overcome or how have you overcome those objections from coaches yeah. in your training? Yeah. Well, first I talk about my s surgery buddies. Um, orthopedic surgeon, uh, cardiac surgeon, and uh, a brain sur neurosurgeon. And they watched some volleyball practices and they came up to me and they said, you know, John, I don't get it in, in sports. If I practiced medicine the way now, the way I did five years ago, I would be sued for malpractice. That's how much I have to keep up on new skill and new ways to perform. My neurosurgeon friend turns to his other two buddies and goes, yeah, hey, you guys are lucky. I'm on a probably two year cycle, the way neurosurgery is evolving. And it's still a motor skill. I mean, they go into your brain and they take out the tumor or they fix your heart or whatever the hell they're doing. And of course, they have a classic statement in the, if you talk to a resident, they'll say, see one, do one, teach one. And I love that because one of the biggest things, Luke, is that we don't let our kids coach less experienced or younger kids enough. 
we force it to be a parent coaching or an adult coaching and you got to have a coach you know and going back to my backwards bicycle thing in a little bit but you know how do you learn most effectively which is really what we're talking about here and the answer is by doing it not by watching it and imagine if you had to learn to ride a bike with one person or 12 people on one bike that you're not going to learn very fast so the whole idea of small sided games and two on two being great for six on six volleyball in my case or the when tokyo finally happens with three on three basketball the level of basketball is going to go up in the world because they're getting more reps and they're having to shoot sooner and that's all but the bicycle situation did your parents hire a bike riding coach you can die riding a bike lou you can't die playing volleyball and i doubt that you you i don't think anybody's probably ever died playing basketball they have heart attacks or they you know pass out and die or whatever but that's not because of basketball that would have happened if they were running to the house or something so basketball and volleyball don't kill anybody and yet we get coached Ball, uh, bike riding kills kids <laughs> every year kids die <laughs> Did you have a bike riding coach hired by your mom and dad? No. Did they send you to bike riding summer camp? And the big question, back to your throw the ball out in part, how many times did your parents do bike riding drills? None. None. And yet you learned to ride a bike in a dangerous sport called bike riding, you know? And so, yes, the game is as game like as possible but in in basketball one person touches one person is practicing guarding and the others are learning a little bit but they're not learning a lot you know they're not learning how to shoot because only one person shoots and and that's the reason this three on three is going to advance the skill level but what a coach's role i think people forget luke i, I think the role of a good coach is two parts it's not transactional. That's the way a lot of coaches are. They're tr transactional. Do this or else I will punish you. Do this and I will be happy and you will get an ice cream cone. What we want them to be is transformational coaches. And in talking to this guy this morning, he said, I'm, I'm a coach educator. I said, well, I'm going to ask you to consider a different word. Do you see the difference between being a coach educator and a coach facilitator? Because what your real role is to facilitate coaches to do it themselves, not to do it for them and to get them to understand. So that means my feedback, part of the mode of learning loop that's so important. The number one thing I do as a coach is essentially give feedback. I'm going to ask you to do a few things. One, Stop being a, uh, we, I heard this just about a month ago, a deficit detective. I call it the coach who crosses their arms, turns on their coaching radar, walks around the gym. And why am I coming up to you? I'm coming up to you because you screwed up. That's what most coaches do. Instead of catching them being good, and there's a book about that, but you don't need to buy it. That's just that's how he coaches <laughs> and and he won a gold medal in, in soccer so he's did okay i guess but in the spirit of that you want to give feed forward when coaches tell you about what you did wrong and they're talking wasting your time about what you can't change so i changed the word feed back i it's not science i, I just say give feed forward something that they can act on but the, as you probably have picked up either from Eric or somebody else, I don't know, the, there's intrinsic learning. That's you just learned to ride a bike. And now you won't ride it for two years, and yet you'll get on it and ride it. So intrinsic is the best learned. This is all about, this is a learning competition. This is not an athletic competition. It's a competition on learning. Who can learn the most, the fastest? Extrinsic coaching, where I tell you what to do, do this or I'll punish you, you know, do this and I give you every answer results in volleyball players who, who make a mistake and then they go like that and they make a mistake and then they go like that and they're always looking at the coach, you know. And 
what we've come to use as coach facilitators, the term guided discovery. I used to call it, and I still do at times, Socratic coaching. Never telling you the answer, but guiding you to the answer. Now, I could have done this here. In this time frame, I would prefer to do it, but it takes longer. <laughs> it just takes longer. And so in talks like TEDx, you're rarely guiding discovery. You're instead presenting ideas and examples. And um, the guy I talked to this morning for his soccer club, you know, I thought he, he found one thing interesting and I'll share it with you here too. When, when, when I have an apple and you have an apple and we sh swap apples, we still got one apple. <laughs> But when I have an idea and you've got an idea and we swap ideas, huh? now we got two ideas. Now we got four ideas. And he was struggling with his country. I think he was Scottish. Um, he was just struggling on how coaches keep everything to themselves and kind of secret. They don't share it. You know, they just, I've got the secret idea and I'm not going to tell anybody. Well, the, the reason I share that again back to volleyball here here's some facts that are pretty scientific in the sense that they're facts <laughs> the number one high school sport for girls in the united states for the last six years is girls volleyball we get really good athletes and they get to go to fifteen thousand d1 d2 jc whatever scholarships that's a boatload of professional four-year training for most of these people, even though we don't have a pro league, they get four years of great experience. And yet our women's team has only won one world gold and no Olympic goals. Our men, Luke, have won nine in the last 35 years, including three Olympic gold medals. No pro league. Well, how many scholarships must the men have? The women have 15,000 one goal in 2014 no olympic goals the men have won nine how you know how many scholarships are there for men in in volleyball no idea so fifteen thousand for girls what do you guess just uh guess. three thousand so the answer is 200. wow 200 <laughs> and yet nine were and no pro league and yet nine of these Olympic things against the pro leagues of Brazil and the pro leagues of Russia. And, you know, they pay a million dollars in the Russian leagues. And yet we beat them in the Olympics when there's, everything's on the line and the best is there. Why is that? Here's why the men in the collegiate 20 D1 programs share ideas to, you know, it's that whole rising tide lifts all boats idea, right? They share ideas. The woman, they keep it to themselves. They don't want the recruits to know about what their ideas are. So, you know, what you're doing it with the TED Talk, in one of its highest priorities, in my idea, my opinion, is simply you're sharing ideas to write, you know, because a rising tide lifts all boats. And, you know, that's that's really, and the work you're doing is really, you know, I think important. And, you know, not just for one TED talk or whatever. Well, yeah, thanks. I appreciate that. And um, obviously, similarly to you, I think that my passion for it has come from one experiencing the power of a really transformational coach, like you just talked about, and then two, wanting to make that large impact that you can only make when you get to the coaches, because um, it it is just it's just mind boggling that this massive group of people that has such a massive impact on our kids has in most cases, little to no training, little to no experience. Um, it's usually, do you have a pulse and did you play it at some okay. point? Maybe. Right. And mm -hmm. um, as a teacher, it's like, man, I had to spend $80,000 in four years learning how to teach, mm -hmm. but to get my coaching certification, uh, it took me about 200 bucks in four hours, yeah. right? Like it's, it, there's just such a disconnect in. Um, and that's a lot of money for those four hours, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Um, it should be free. And I, I also think 
I mean, consider this in your, in your TED talk to a degree. I'm talking, yes, I've been the team leader and won a gold medal and coached and won silver medals at the Pan Am Games and helped the coaches and win Paralympic medals. Yeah, I, I understand the 3% or the top 1%. And my son is a, you know, in that top 1%. He's a professional player in Brazil, in Berlin, and he's starting and he's, you know, on the national team roster. But I focus on the 97% that don't get those college scholarships. And you, you'd ask the first sort of question in your list, why do you coach sports? I coach sports because I want to develop amazing leaders. That's the player or the person. No, I'm in the person. The volleyball player is a vehicle. The basketball is a vehicle to develop amazing leaders. But if I'm controlling everything, then they never get to develop their leadership skills. <laughs> and so I keep making sure that the gym is a place of trust and safety and and a place that you can make mistakes. Um, John Cleese, the great Monty Python um, comedian, he wrote an article in Forbes magazine, I think in the in the yeah, in the eighties, called "It's a Business Magazine, mind you." No more mistakes, and you're through. What? I thought I needed to be perfect, you know, and yet I thought my company can't. No, he wants people to err because he understands that that's the process of learning to ride a bike. And that's the process of learning to do things you've never done before and to push your own envelope. But most coaches go bonkers when there's a mistake made and they don't understand that, you know. But I, I'd have to say that leadership development is the most important thing which is why when I got that ABCA award, the first two people, 900 and 300, and it was their record. And I don't know, the second one was something like 1,200, a really good coach out of Gallaudet, Peggy. And then I stood up and said, well, that's not bad. My record is 10,000 plus and 35. And everybody laughed. And I said, you see, I don't know my win-loss record the way these guys do, I know, yeah, I sure I've won the, this Olympic gold or this thing as a coach, but the reality is that I'm judging you about by never being a child's last coach. That's a pretty impactful statement for me. I'm judging you. If you go zero and 30 and your kids all play basketball next year, great coaching <laughs> and I've done it in ice hockey. I've gone zero and 30 and yet every kid played hockey the next year. And that's way better coaching in my humble opinion than going 30 and oh, and seven of the kids quit. <laughs> yeah. I, that, that's so powerful. And it's something that's come up in, in a lot of my conversations it, and it just, it ties back to redefining success, right. In sports sure. and, and for these kids and as, as a coach, like what is success when you're coaching 10 year olds and basketball or whatever sport you're coaching them. And, and I love that. And even as I'm coaching ninth grade boys in basketball, like a really successful year again is what you said. Like I, I want to win for the kids sake. Cause I know how fun it is for kids to win. But mm -hmm. if, if every single one of those 16 guys tries out for the team again next year and has a great experience this year, they feel really connected to their, to their teammates. Um, like that's, that's so much success right there. Coaches, just a quick time out from this episode to tell you about the upcoming Coaches Club cohort. Too many coaches feel alone, frustrated, and stagnant in their coaching. Are you tired of toxic or average cultures? A lack of leadership from your players? Practice not transferring to games? Excessive parent conflicts? And a lack of training and support? Unfortunately, most coaches just don't have a support system of other coaches that encourages and challenges them to grow. The Coaches Club course and community is an eight-week online cohort course that helps coaches get better at teaching and leading. It consists of eight weekly master classes that cover specific coaching topics, four one-on-one -on -one mentorship calls with me, access to the cohort group chat, access to the private Coaches Club Facebook group, and more. 
The Coaches Club isn't for everybody. If you're stuck in your ways, think you have all the answers, and only care about winning, then this isn't for you. But if you want to improve and grow, you're curious, and you care about more than just winning, then the Coaches Club is for you. Getting into the club is easy. First, schedule a free call with me to talk about joining the next cohort. Then, participate in the next cohort and community. And lastly, apply what you learn in your coaching to get better at teaching and leading and help you and your team reach your potential. The first cohort launches in June of 2021. Spots are limited and multiple spots have already been claimed. If you want to learn more about the Coaches Club, go to transformsport.org slash coaches club or click the link in the show details. And if you want to join the next Coaches Club cohort, schedule a call today to talk with me about it and reserve your spot. You can go to transformsport.org slash coaches club or just click the link in the show details to schedule a call today. I want to circle back to something you started to talk about uh, with mistakes and create an environment where it's okay for kids to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. I think that that's hard for a lot of coaches. Like you said, coaches want to have a practice that looks pretty. Um, What are, I guess maybe two parts of the question. First, like what has to happen internally maybe for a coach to be okay with an environment where kids are making a lot of mistakes. And then two, practically, how do they create an environment where kids feel safe to make mistakes? Well, I think that's a great question. And, and I immediately thought of Karch Karai, um, our three time Olympic gold medal player in volleyball, who's becoming one of the best coaches. And mm. he won a, he won a um, silver medal twice, but he hasn't won a gold as a, as a coach. And he models that mistakes are okay. That's the first place. He admits mistakes. He doesn't attempt to even show perfection. I find that when I start a, I, when I start a practice season, uh, an entire season, I pull the parents, I pull the kids, and I have a talk on motor learning <laughs> before we even get on the court. This is how we learn. Mistakes are okay. They show me you're pushing your envelope. I want to see mistakes in this gym. And I know the difference between intent and outcome. So don't stress. And if I see a mistake I've never seen before, I'm going to stop practice and call it out and go, oh my God, I've never seen this mistake in my life. And it hasn't happened for about 10 years. <laughs> so trust me, you're going to err and I'm okay with it. And I'm going to err because it's part of motor learning. It's part of the variance of hitting out versus hitting in and whatever, as you learn to be more accurate. Um, That fact, there's a guy named Trevor Reagan, who you may have dug up or talked to or read his great stuff. Um, He had a website for a long time called Train Ugly, and now he's kind of gotten into more business money-making stuff, and he calls it the learning lab or something like that. But for me, this guy, Trevor Reagan, is a kid younger than you who I drove the 12 beautiful hours from Colorado to Lander, Wyoming to do a volleyball camp for his mom, Janet Reagan, who's a great volleyball coach in a little town out of the Wind Rivers. And so the camp is starting and I, at eight o'clock, everybody's there and a bunch of parents are there. And I said, okay, we're going to spend the next 90 minutes in a condensed motor learning thing. I'm going to put up some principles, including making mistakes and, and see, do, and tell, and we're going to do all this. And we're going to show why random is maybe frustrating because you don't feel so good because you're doing it in a row. You feel good about yourself, but that's not the way the game is played. And I did that, and then I did the day camp, and then I went over to Janet, their family's home, and Trevor, who was in his second year of doing basketball after college, basketball camps to make money, goes, um, Mr. Kessel, does, uh, does this motor learning stuff work for basketball? <laughs> and 
And I said, yeah, it's how you learn a skill, not volleyball only, but basketball too. And we, he went off and he's now making his living. He got the train ugly because he said, where can I get more examples of uh, an exploratorium and this and application in volleyball? And I sent him to the national team gym and the head coach there kept saying, train ugly. That was Karch's made up phrase. We train ugly. We know that ugly is okay. And he said, is that copyrighted? And I said, ask Karch if it's okay to use it. And he created a website for a good eight years that way, or maybe a little less. But the principles are to push your own envelope and to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And, and, you know, and then you reward it and you high five it and you, and you literally, I mean, I'll tell you, Luke, one of the things that really pisses me off is coaches who do physical punishment. It pisses me off no end. And I've written some blogs about it. <clears throat> one of the best movies you might want to catch is called Buck. Um, believe it's on Netflix. I, I don't know for sure, but Buck is about... A, an abused kid who became a horse trainer who could train any horse. And he, he, he's, there's a documentary and it's, he's, he's a horse whisperer. But if you think about how animals are trained, no animal is trained through punishment. They, they aren't, they're, you know, they're, they get the, the, dolphin to figure out to jump through the hoop at 20 feet by first putting the hoop on the ground and then giving it a fish you know on the ground on the, in the bottom of the pool and then going up and when it goes through it gets a fish and then they raise it up higher and then they get it out of the water and they keep raising it up and every time it does it close to what they want they give it fish and now they're jumping 20 feet out of the water and they never punish them and yet in volleyball and in basketball and in hockey, it's fascinating because I do so many Olympic sports coaching the coaches. Biathlon doesn't punish the players. Riflery doesn't punish the players. Swimming doesn't, oh, you lost, get out and give me 20. You know, they don't punish. But in some of the team sports, of basketball, volleyball, um, ice hockey, Punishment is one of those old dregs to get rid of that keeps happening. And sure, Steve Kerr doesn't do it that way. And, and Popovich doesn't and stuff like that per se, but it's, it's, it's happening because of, I'm gonna send you down a rabbit hole maybe here. We won't talk about it the whole time, but, um, the guy has written some New York Times best-selling books, and he's really smart about how do you learn. And his name is Dr. Daniel Kahneman. Um, and I first read an article, Luke, called in Discover Magazine in 1985, wherein he was, he's a mathematician psychologist and he was teaching Israeli fighter pilot instructors how to be better instructors, how to be better coaches of doing a motor skill called flying a $2 million aircraft, which is if you crash it, you not only die, but it's 2 million bucks. So a little bit more important than missing a spike in volleyball. And <laughs> he talked about the power of praise and how punishment doesn't work. And the instructors raised their hand and go, with all due respect, I think what you're saying is totally for the birds. I have praised a pilot after a good landing and invariably they do worse. And I have chewed them out in the tradition of Israeli Air Force after a bad landing and I've chewed them out and punished them and invariably they do better. Hmm, don't be telling me this stuff doesn't work. And he said in this article, he said, he stood back and went, oh my God, it's the most exciting moment of my life to realize that these gifted instructors, because they're not the, the pilots learning, they're the instructors, were being fooled by regression to the mean. 
the regression of the mean is one of the most important things I think a coach should know and be comfortable with and relax and chill and and just know that it's going to happen. And so the example I'll use is basketball. Um, if I shoot 10 straight, should you praise me, punish me, or ignore me as a coach? You just shoot the ball 10 straight times or you make it 10 straight times? You make it. <laughs> Nothing but net. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to let you know. Like, I love it. Keep shooting it. Okay, all right. What happens after you 10 in a row it, it statistically? Because isn't shooting about 50-50? For a really good shooter? Yeah, it depends on where you're shooting from. But yeah, the next time you're probably going to go two or three for 10. Okay. So this is called a regression to the mean. What your coaches, what my coaches, what people sadly get fooled by, like these Israeli instructors, is that I praise you and then I see you get worse. I jinx you. I break your concentration. I shouldn't have said anything. I told the assistant coach, look at Luke. He's, he's shooting lights out. Really? He watches the next 10 and you make two out of, you know, you make five out of 10. You just, you do your average after point five out of 10, but it's still, you miss half of them. And I go, I shouldn't have said anything. No, you should say something. But the reason it's so important, going back to my huge peeve here that I seem to be on a diatribe about, punishment. When they do zero out of 10, what do many coaches do? They, they, don't, they don't tell them anything or they get on to them. Or they bench them. Yeah. <laughs> That's not saying anything, but saying a lot. Yeah. So get over here and sit on the bench. Luke, what the hell is going wrong with you? You, you usually shoot five out of 10 and 10 in a row. Your grandmother's here. She's dying of cancer. And you're playing like this in front of your grandmother? What the, I want you to sit there and think about what the hell you're doing wrong. And when you're ready to, to get back in there, tell me what the hell you want to do. In fact, before you do that, give me 20 push-ups. I'm so pissed at you right now. And so you do 20 push-ups. And you do all this other thinking and bullshit. And then what happens when you get in for the next 10 statistically, mathematically, probably? You're going to make some. Five yeah, out of ten. Yeah. And I go as the coach. <laughs> yeah, that punishment really taught old Luke a lesson. I'm finally getting to him. No, <laughs> you're totally screwed up because you got fooled by regression of the mean. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think such a, a yes, all of us so is so good and so accurate. And I think so so much of it is rooted in the coaches are so. And it's easy. Uh, I can do it too. We get so attached to the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. So that example of a, a shooter in basketball, like I, we have to tell our, our players this all the time. Like it's a good shot when it leaves your hands, regardless of whether it goes in or not. Like we're just focused on getting a great shot. We can't control if it goes in or not. Like we are never going to take you out of a game if you shot a good shot and missed. Like we just That's won't. Good. Right. And, and so like taking even if the they do zero out of 10, even if they do zero, <laughs> like one of our best shooters a couple games ago, like he, he was like, Oh, for six to start the game. And we're just like, you, if you don't shoot it when you're open, we're going to take you out for that because that serves our team. Like you must shoot it when you're open and you have a good mm -hmm. shot. Um, right. Like we do not care how many of you missed. You're going to, you're going to hit it. Like we knew he was going to go back to that mean right on the other mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, it, it's so hard for coaches to detach themselves from the outcome of a kid's performance. Um, but if they don't do that, then it's really hard to get out of that mindset of not punishing kids for mistakes and even just understanding like, oh, this is just a regression to the mean. Like the, there's nothing wrong with the kid. It just happens. It's, it's, and so the rabbit hole is to study regression to the mean. Now what's really cool for me is that I did that in 85, I think, and I learned that. And then I saw him write a couple of books about statistics that are really good, more economics than other stuff, but it's still real. And lo and behold, I'm 
in 2003, my kid's 12, and I'm going to college here next to school, next to my house, and he's going to summer school, and I look on the economics board, and Daniel Kahneman wins the Nobel Peace Prize for the same shit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> because people will do really dumb things to save 50 cents and then blow 500 bucks without doing any smart things. And he shows the fallibility of human reasoning, basically, mm. is what's going on. Yeah, that's so good. So interesting. I, okay, I have, I have three final questions for you. Right. Um, first one is, what are some practical ways that coaches across sports can create a more fun environment for athletes? That's the number one reason kids stop playing sports. They say it's not fun anymore. How can coaches create an environment that's more fun for athletes? Okay, so there's a couple thoughts big picture. Um, I think practice in basketball and other sports, volleyball, we call it king of the court. Mm -hmm. um, I think small sided game slash playing needs to happen more in practice. Not stop coaching, but we don't drill basketball, we play basketball. Now you've got an opportunity to play one-on-one. -on -one. Your stupid ass sport comes into a gym and puts up six friggin' hoops, six hoops. So your class of 24 kids comes running out there and they can play two on two. And the coach can be just crazy busy giving feed forward as he walks around to the six courts. My sport has this dumbass cultural tradition of when you go into the lock, the gym closet and fight past those 15 damn brown turds called basketballs. And you look and you find the volleyball and you pull out the volleyball and you put up the net. <sighs> And now what are you going to do? You're going to play 12 on 12 and you're going to go, fuck, basketball is so much more fun than volleyball. Volleyball, all I do is go. I touch it one out every 24 times. But when I'm playing basketball, I'm having fun playing two on two. So for volleyball, we have to put a net down the middle of the court and get all these small courts going and get learning by doing. Learning by doing is so incredibly important, Luke. It's so, my kids watched me drive for 16 years. And when they got behind the wheel, they did not know how to drive. They had no clue. And my insurance rates were up at $2,000 a month. And as they drove and didn't have accidents, the rates dropped because they learned to drive by driving, not by watching. So we need to get more of those opportunities, I believe, in practice. And so, you know, Anson Dorrance has some really cool workup ladders for soccer and his book, Training Soccer Champions, is, a, is brilliant. It's probably 20 years old, 1991, I think. Um, but team sports need to have part of practice with these game-like, competitive, scored, almost ladders that, that say, yeah, this guy's the best right now. And that's okay because whoever Luke plays with, he wins. Now you may have to set a rule that says, um, in, uh, you, you can't in 10 shots, you have to have five and five each, how you do it. I don't care, but you can't have Luke shoot all 10. And then when you go to another partner, the same rule is there or something like that. I don't know. I, uh, it's just in my sport, there's a game called speedball, which is as soon as the ball is an error, another team serves and takes the place of the team that lost. And every game is one point. And so you're either getting ready to come on or you're on. <laughs> and that makes my kids will go through a beautiful hour and 45 minute practice of two hours. 
I think everything's wonderful. And if I haven't done speedball, they'll go, uh, coach, when are we going to play speedball? <laughs> you know? So if there's anything like that, incorporate it into your practice in a way that you can rank and score and show progress to the kids. You know what I mean? Show progress. Look, you came into the season and you were there and now you're here, you know, and, and that I think is a, a big part of making practice more fun. And you know, if you talk, if you go right now to your town's volleyball guru and say, what skill are you going to teach first? Invariably, they're going to say forearm passing. If you can't pass the serve, you can't set it and then you can't hit it. So you got to learn to pass. No, uh -uh, no. They come in and they spike first <laughs> and they spike and they then help set their teammates and then once they've done those things they start to do this forum passing stuff because it's important but the fun is in the shooting and whether it's a shoot around or I just throw that term out not knowing what the hell it is I just know people do it <laughs> basketball you know, or what but he, you know we Anson does an incredible job of ranking his players based on not just winning drills but he, you know he does one versus one then he does two versus two then he does three versus three and then he does six versus six and then he finally does 11 versus 11. and you see your score and the next practice you're not with those same players for those games and as practice unfolds over the course of weeks or months you're going why am i not starting luke he wins with everybody he plays with what what's wrong with me what am i missing type stuff but so i think that's i think scoring is fun but creative ways to score with rewards um kids don't care how much you know about basketball until they know how much they you care about them and so I've got a drawing of a, a player info page with the front and the back, and it asks 30 questions about the kids. What's your favorite number? I should know every player's favorite number. So I can tap into that when, well, your favorite number is seven, so we get seven of these. Oh, well, the coach cares and knows my favorite number. And knows my favorite candy and knows my favorite room in the house and knows what I had as a most recent disappointment and all these other things that go back to the it's it's about the player and their leadership and their humanness so I'm going to give you a a cool TEDx possible basketball only talk clue you'll start it off and you'll say who here coaches basketball so what's your answer? Me. Okay. Your, yeah. hands, your hands up. And now in that, I'm going to walk up to you right now. And right now through the screen, I'm giving you a basketball. Coach it. Yeah, doesn't happen. <laughs> you don't coach basketball. <laughs> you coach amazing humans. And the game of basketball is your vehicle, but you don't coach basketball. And I get to do that. It's in, you know, 90% of the people raise their hands and then you hand them a volleyball and you step back and go, all right, show me how good you are. There's your volleyball. <laughs> you know? And then they sit there and they go, shit, I don't coach volleyball, I coach kids. Oh, well that's different. <laughs> you know? And that gets you off onto helping the whole person because you coach this amazing leader, you coach this, you coach this dad's son, you coach this amazing math student, you coach this person, not a basketball player. And, and I think that's really important. Yeah, that's, that's really good and, and powerful. Um, second to last question. Uh, what are your top three things that you think, hey, every coach, every sport, every level. 
Motor learning. <laughs> there we go. You know the question. Motor learning. Uh, yeah. No, you have to study and keep on top of the latest. Mm -hmm. How do we learn faster? Motor learning. The second thing would be something that's similar but different. How much of basketball is mental, Luke? So much. So, so much. Yeah, give me a percentage out of 100. Uh, wow. I, I think that is a little bit dependent on the, on the player in some situations, but I, I mean – 30, 40% of the game, at least. Okay. And in volleyball, we tend to see a higher number, but at 40%, how much of your practice is mental? And it doesn't jive. <laughs> it doesn't match up, yet it's really important. But no, yeah, a small to... I mean, some days, no, no percentage of the practice is spent developing the mental aspect of the game. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah it's, and it's, it's something I'm trying to improve. And I'm like, okay, where can I, where can I, you know, insert this into intentionally teaching this? And I, I think one of the ways that I've improved and I'm trying to get better is, is to use more teachable moments within the flow of practice. Um, and to a lot of times you know, just one-on-one -on -one um, go give a kid some feedback about what I can see is happening in their mind in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, again, like you said, it's a huge percentage of every sport, yet it's a small percentage of what we coach. And therefore, this guided discovery helps you ask those mental questions and let them figure it out so they don't look to you for the answer, you know, which is what we hate. Yeah. <clears throat> the third thing I'm going to say is, because of the, what you've just said in the last minute and a half or so. And that is that words matter. And we need to study and use words that are more inspiring and more emotional. And, and on top of that, we need to get rid of a word you just used twice. Try. Get rid of that out of your gym. Get rid of that out of your TED talk. Get rid of that when you talk to anybody. Because if I said, I'll try and be here for this three o'clock talk, what was I really telling you? Probably not going to be there. Exactly. And so it gives them an excuse to not do it. Very, it's not Yoda, you know, it's just, Think about it. I'll try and be there. What am I really telling you? I'm not going to be there. It's totally different when I say, I'll be there. Now, so you don't try to put that into practice. You either do it or you don't. And I, I don't want to have the excuse of, well, I tried. <laughs> no, you didn't do it. <laughs> you know, you're, you're just using this crutch word. And, and the other crutch word that there's two other big ones that I get rid of. One is, but, you know, this has been a great talk, but can you hear that it's a great talk? No, you're, you're waiting for the slam because humans use this word all the time to delegitimize what I had just said. So if you simply change the word but to the word and, it, the, what I said first is still heard by the human. And I'm not disqualifying it with a but. <laughs> yeah, and absolutely. The last one is the word don't. And it's a, it's a huge pet peeve of mine because the brain is unable to store not existing things. It's a positronic brain, you know? And when I say, don't think about a pink elephant, you know, the, does it have a party hat or not? <laughs> and, and yet coaches talking to their kids say don't. And you can see in baseball and all these other sports, all these amazing examples. I think one just happened in the World Series where, you know, don't pitch them high outside or whatever, and goes high outside. And 
we, we simply have to get rid of that and phrase our feedback or feed forward in our guided discovery in a way that never uses the word don't or rarely uses the word don't and uses it in, a, in one of those sandwiches where I say, this is what I'd like, don't do this, this is what I'd like. So. Yeah, no, those are powerful. And I am going to eliminate those words from, from my vocabulary because I absolutely, yeah, I can see what you're, what you're talking about in the feedback and the feed forward that you give athletes. Uh, my last question is this, uh, what is one thing, the first thing that comes to your mind when you think about something you wish you would have known when you started coaching? Okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do two things here. One, I'm going to tell a story. And that's because humans remember information far better if you tell stories than if I tell you facts or figures. Um, it's just how our brain, again, is wired for learning and wired to remember. And, you know, long before there was the internet and paper and pencil and whatever, you know, we spent thousands and tens of thousands of years storytelling. So that, you know, our brain can do that. So that said, um, the, I flew to Europe to do a clinic and I ha sat in the exit row because I've got long legs and next to me was a, a gal flying over and she was going to win some sort of major European math prize award. And she was a math teacher, math professor or whatever. And so we started talking about learning. And as we went through some of these getting enough reps and making it game like and whatever, you know, she said, you know, I'm getting this award because I'm actually probably the one that finally had the most success with helping math teachers and their parents, the kids' parents, with the line, never steal the pencil from the child. She says, well-intentioned parents and math teachers grab the pencil and show and slash solve the problem and write it down. And the kid isn't learning how to do the math as he or she watches. They have to do it. And I said, that's pretty awesome because going back to your original question, I probably touched the ball as a volleyball coach a thousand times in a practice at the beginning of my career. I threw it to him. I set it to him. I tossed it to be spiked. I served it at him. I know that in basketball, you don't shoot free throws so that they get good at rebounding. You let them do it. And you don't inbound bat passes for, but in volleyball, we're really screwed up. <laughs> we steal so many reps and it's tradition. It's to, pr so practice looks good, you know? <laughs> and, and so I'm a coach, I'm a coach. Look, I'm controlling practice, I'm helping practice. So specifically, I think more in my sport, because in shooting, I don't shoot for you. I just guide your work. And, but in volleyball and probably in other sports, I know it was in lacrosse was happening. In lacrosse, we stood in lines. Oh, God. I, I mean, I had to really rebel against the lacrosse program for a while until they got it because they would do this thing called man ball. And, you know. You take out the guy as the other teammate. It's a two-on-one drill, and the ball goes down, and one of them takes out the guy so the other person takes out the man so the other person can pick up the ball. And I watched as the kids, 22 kids, stood in a line of three each, and the coach would flick the ball, and then yammer, 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 and the coach would flick another ball, and this line stood out. So I would... Since we learn by doing, Luke, I would argue really strongly to create 
almost every practice you can where there is never standing in line, which means I'm getting the reps. And if your sport is easier because the coach doesn't steal the ball from you as much as they do in volleyball, but it's still about those reps in a game-like situation and a competitive situation. Because as an aside, I, I also learned over the course of the first 10 years that if I believe in game-like training and training in reality, then I am also saying that I should be scoring just about every game or drill that I'm doing. We even call them drills, game-like drills. Because when we play, every serve results in a point. But when we drill, there isn't enough scoring going on. And so I'm stealing that nervousness or that rejoicing or that tracking or that, you know, I value it and therefore, but I'm not scoring it, you know, I shouldn't do that. Thanks again to John for joining me on the podcast. Coaches, if you want to connect with John, you can follow him on Twitter at John Kessel USAV, and you can find out more about the lodge he and his wife operate at bisonpeaklodgecolorado.com. There will be links to both of those in the show details. If you enjoyed this episode and would like a free copy of notes covering what we discussed, go to transformsport.org slash podnotes or click the link in the show details to get a free copy of the notes from today's episode. Included in those notes will be links to an article on decision-making and an article on mistakes that John referenced in our conversation. And finally, if you found this episode valuable, please take a minute to rate, review, and subscribe to the Coaches Club podcast wherever you listen. And give us a shout out on Twitter at Coaches Club underscore. That's C-O-A-C-H-E-S Club underscore. Thanks for listening to the Coaches Club podcast powered by Transform Sport, where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training. 